Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to the Season Pass question and answer session. Uh, I'm going to call this session number one in case we begin doing more of these during your Season Pass season this year. We're really excited you're a Season Pass holder, and part of that uh, Season Pass package not only includes the Season Pass, all of the special Season Pass bonuses, and uh, all of the workshops we're doing this season, which are six of them, but it also includes this question and answer, and it's time for you to ask your questions to Aaron and get live answers and feedback from him. So this is a really exciting session, and Aaron's got uh, himself, he's present, he's ready to answer questions from everyone. If you have a question and you're listening live, you have an option to raise your hand by the, using the little hand icon uh, on your GoTo control panel, uh, webinar control panel right there. Go to webinar control panel. Just raise your hand, and you can talk verbally live on the air and ask question your ask Aaron your question. Uh, you'll need obviously a microphone and uh, something for your voice to come through. If you'd rather type your question in, or if you don't have a microphone, there's a spot for you to do that right into your control panel. Just type your question directly in there, and I can ask Aaron that uh, live on the air. We had a few people from all over the world that are registered for the season pass that are unable to be with us tonight, so they sent in some questions to us. Uh, some are from you know other places, some are here in the U.S., uh, and I would like to get to some of those and the questions coming in live. So we're going to go ahead and get started, and we'll take as long as we need tonight, and then we will wrap up with a few other things. Aaron, how are you doing tonight? Doing good? Hey, I'm doing really well, Joel. Fantastic. Thanks. We're excited you're here. And uh, are you ready to get started and kind of give us an idea? Absolutely. So what, I can't wait. I've been looking forward to this. Great. Give me, give me kind of an idea of what you've been up to, Aaron. I think I'd like to hear, and I think our audience would like to hear also, what's, uh, what are some things you've been working on lately? Well, you know, it, it, it's always interesting when, when people ask those kinds of questions because, um, you know, as an actor, you never really know what's happening. I mean, there, there are some people who are fortunate enough to – you know, be cast in film after film when they know where they're going to be or they're on a, a television series as a regular and they know where they're going to be. But, you know, for, for most of us, we really have no idea. And so uh, sometimes people will say, well, have you been busy? Yeah, I've been really busy, uh, not necessarily getting paid for, for some of the auditions that I've gone on. Um, but this happens to be a time period where I have been busy and I also have been booking things, which is um, which is nice. Um, I'm sure many of you know I just booked this NBC show, which I, I was really excited about shooting, and I've been sending a bunch of blog videos about. Um, I also just had an audition for 30 Rock on NBC. It's the uh, last season for the television series, so um, I hope I hope I book it. You know, you, you never know. They were seeing men, they were seeing women for this particular part. So, it it was pretty wide open. And just just uh, on a little side note with that, it was an incredible experience. It's the second time I've auditioned for Thirty Rock, and it's really cool when you go into Rockefeller Center and you go into the casting uh, area for NBC. And, you know, you're walking down the hall and you know all the incredible things that are coming out of these places. And I walked past the where the Jimmy Fallon show was shot. And anyhow, it, it was it was a really uh, it was a great experience uh, like the audition. And actually, and since you asked me, let, let, let me just tell you, and, and I'm going to save um, a lot of this information to uh, maybe present as a full workshop. But. It is so important to understand when you are auditioning who the scene is about. And, and I can't, I shouldn't, and I won't say specifically what took place because it, it's a pretty big moment in the show, so I don't want to give anything away before it airs. But clearly, the scene was not about me. And it would have been very easy for me to read it in a way so that it was about me, to make it humorous, to make it uh, very interesting, eye-catching, so that people are looking at, at my read. But I've done this long enough to understand that when the scene is not about you, don't make it about you. So you've got to, you, you kind of have to use all of your acting skills to 
pull back. It's almost like you're a sprinter and the gun goes off and you've been training all your life to run as fast as you possibly can but the in order for you to win this race you've got to end up in last place and run as slowly as possible so that was my goal to make the read as calm um, as smoothly as possible and make sure that there was no attention whatsoever drawn to me and I thought I was very successful at it so and yeah we'll see and and the other thing that actually I just had an audition yesterday for an independent film it's an independent feature and uh, I got a phone call on today and um, I'm put on hold and I'm the only one who's on hold for this particular role so it looks like I'll be shooting this weekend which uh, that's pretty cool really looking forward to it so um, at least acting and, and, and actually well not, one other thing and then I'll I'll end my uh, uh, my work history here for the week uh, while I was in New York uh, at this audition for 30 Rock I had gotten a phone call about a go see in Philadelphia for a print job and I simply couldn't do both so what I did was I contacted the agent and I said you know look I know it's always best to show up in person but could I shoot a digital photo you know let me know what you're looking for and I'll email it to you and you can send it to the client you know would they be willing to look at it and you know a lot of time well it depends on where you live in New York typically they're gonna say no you've got to be here they want to see you uh, sometimes it, it can work so it, it was a long shot but I got home uh, from the audition and immediately had a JPEG shot emailed it over to the agent no I haven't heard anything so I'm assuming I didn't get it so anyhow, it's been uh, it's been a pretty hectic week, but a really good week, uh, really enjoyable. And um, and then I've got this thing to, uh, tonight. We're going to be answering questions from you know everybody who's uh, holding the season pass, and I'm uh, really looking forward to it. Fantastic. Well, if you're just joining us again, uh, a few people came on uh, later than the top of the hour. So if you'd like to ask a question live to Aaron, if you have a microphone capability on your computer, there's a place for you to raise your hand. Uh, in the GoToWebinar control panel. If you'd prefer to just type the question in, feel free to do that also in the control panel, and we can uh, go ahead and ask Aaron that question live tonight. We are really excited you've joined us. And uh, let's jump right in. I've got a question from Jen in Arizona. Aaron, if you're ready, okay. for, if you're ready for questions. Uh, Absolutely. Hi, Jen. <laughs> if she says, um, if I hear about an advertising agency in my area, can I just stop by and talk to someone in their office, like just coming off the street? So you might want to address that. Yeah, that's that, that, that's a great question. And and just so people know, the reason why both actors and models want to um, get noticed by advertising agencies is because sometimes they are the ones who actually decide which actor gets hired for the TV commercial or the radio commercial or which model gets hired for the commercial modeling job and the two people that you want to get to know at the advertising agencies are the art director and the creative director and the creative director is the person who comes up with the concept for the ad campaign campaign and the art director takes that idea and puts it on paper and it's called a layout and that way it will show what the ads going to look like sometimes they'll have the actual words uh, the headlines the copy which are the words in the ad right on the paper sometimes they just have letters and it just kind of shows uh, the space of where the photos go and where the words will eventually go and then they'll take that layout show it to the client you know whoever this ad is for and then once that gets approved then they will actually start looking for the model for the shot so that's why the art and creative directors at advertising agencies are very important people for us you know actors and models so to answer your question very specifically, Jen, no. <laughs> Don't just go to an advertising agency and knock on the door because uh, you're not going to be looked at very favorably. Uh, they're busy. They're doing millions of different projects. And uh, I think it would be a little bit uh, presumptuous and also a little weird just to kind of walk in and crash their uh, daytime job and say hey would you guys be interested in talking with me so what I would recommend though is you should be sending 
a headshot if you're interested in getting acting work with the advertising agency, or um, a demo reel, a voiceover demo reel if you're interested in trying to do radio commercials or voiceovers uh, for the advertising agency, or if you are a model, send a composite sheet. And just so that everybody knows, a composite sheet is what models use. They're called comp cards, Z cards on the west coast of the US or composite sheets. It's all the same thing and it's the model's calling card. Typically you'll have one photo on the front and you could have two or three or four photos on the back. There are some composite sheets that have four sides to them. Some composite sheets have all the photos on one side. Uh, there's no specific format for a composite sheet. Typically, they're around uh, five by seven, six by eight, but I've seen eight by ten uh, composite sheets. So it's up to you. But in either case, if you want to try to get commercial modeling work from an ad agency, that's what you want to send. And a couple other things that you want to keep in mind when you are sending a headshot and/or a composite sheet to the art director or the creative director, send a short cover letter. Uh, you, you don't want to put your life history. Uh, you know when you lost your first tooth, uh, what your you know your kindergarten teacher's name was. I would just make it very simple to the point. Uh, you know, give your name. If you have an agent, then have your agent's contact information on on the cover letter. I like to have a headshot on the top of the of the. Um, cover letter so that way as they're reading the letter they can also see your face and if you're working with an agent you will have all of your agents contact information there and just you know let them know that you're interested in TV commercials to be you know considered for TV commercials maybe radio spots whatever you're interested in doing and uh, let them know that you can contact your agent um, uh, for future projects, if you do have an agent or they can contact you directly, make sure your contact information is there and send it to them. And what typically will happen is they'll probably throw it away, but they'll look at it first. And, that, and that's all that you really care about. You want them to open up the envelope, look at your picture, uh, recognize uh, who you are, read your letter, and they're probably not going to store it in their file cabinets. Years ago they would, but not anymore. Everything is done online. But you want them to be familiar with you, and they might be in the middle of a project that is absolutely perfect for you, and they can call you in or potentially hire you right from your photos. Or they might remember you, and they might see you at a go-see, the audition for models, or at an audition in the future, and they might not know where they know you from. Maybe they're thinking, oh, maybe I've seen this person you know, at some job on a billboard, on a poster, on a TV spot. You look familiar to me. Well, they might, they might think that you're familiar to them, but it's only because they threw your pictures away two months ago. But in either case, that's great. That's what you want. So... Uh, the short version at the end of my story here is no don't just knock on a door walk in and introduce yourself that, that really wouldn't be a good idea uh, but definitely send materials to them and make sure that they remember who you are and you can periodically you know maybe every month every two months some send them a postcard send them a note just letting them know that you're around okay okay great thank you uh, so the next question comes from Donna in Florida. She asks, do I need a work permit to just work as an extra or on any project for one day? And just to let you know, I'm a high school student. Yeah, I was going to ask, I assume you're, you're um, a high school student or, or younger. Um, look, it's a, it's a tricky question uh, because I'm not an attorney, um, so I really can't give out you know, legal type advice, but let me just share uh, some information that that I've heard, and certainly uh, I would check that out uh, locally just to make sure uh, no rules are being broken. But my understanding is, if you're not living in New York or LA, where they do have, especially in LA, they have very very strict child labor laws. Um, you know, if you're working a day on something as an extra, I really don't think that that would be necessary. You can always call uh, your local government and find out about that. 
but I would be surprised if you needed a work permit. I could be wrong, but I don't think that is the case. You know, if you get hired to work on a television series and you're working regularly, you're working on a film, uh, and you're going to be working on it for quite some time, yeah, absolutely, you're, you'll definitely need one. But I, I would tend to doubt that you would need one if you're just working one day on, on, on a project. But, you know, if you do have an agent, that would be a great question to ask your agent. Um, and the other thing that you can do is just to make sure that you're following all the rules and regulations, whoever is hiring you, if it, let's say it's extras casting, and they, you know, there's a casting company that is handling all the extras, let's say on a feature film, ask them. Just say, look, I'm working on this one day. I'm a high school student. Uh, is, it, is it necessary for me to get a work permit? And they'll let you know because they certainly would know because they have to follow all the rules and regulations of that particular area. So th that's what I would recommend doing. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, th so this question comes actually, this is one of our international uh, students, James from Scotland. He says, if I book commercial modeling work, and this is going to be a tough one to answer because this is from Scotland. Maybe you want to answer about the United States, Aaron, and then you know it might apply somewhere else. Uh, are taxes taken out of my paycheck? Well, I, I can't speak for work in, in Europe, but I can tell you in the States, here's, here's how it works. And, and actually, uh, I've known uh, a few very successful models that have run into problems uh, because of how they handled their finances for modeling work. When you are booked in the, in the U.S. and it's a modeling job, no taxes are withheld. Typically what will happen is, assuming you have an agent, you will fill out it's something, there's something called a voucher and a voucher is a three color coded copy. It's, a, it's an invoice and you fill out all the information, you keep a copy, your agent will get a copy. You want to send it to your agent as soon as possible. And whoever is hiring you or whoever is actually being invoiced, whoever is paying for the job, they get a copy of the voucher as well. And it will have all kinds of information, uh, the date of the shoot, who the photographer was, what the product was, how long the ad's going to run, what your hourly rate is, or if, are you getting paid a day rate? Is this a high exposure format, uh, billboards, posters, on the side of a bus, on the internet, on a package, things like that. And then what will happen is your check will be sent to your agent. Then, and, and by the way, just on a little bit of a side note, in the commercial modeling world, because there is no union, uh, it can take up to 90 days to get paid from a commercial modeling job. I, I would never even think of calling an agent prior to 90 days uh, after doing a job. It just, unfortunately, it takes a long time. If you do, I mean, sometimes I have been paid much sooner, and when that does happen, I'm just very thankful, but typically it takes up to 90 days. So what will happen is a check will be cut and sent to your agent. Then... Once that check clears, your agent will take typically a 20% commission fee from whatever you earn. So if it's, you know, it's a $100 job, they take, you know, $20 out. Then what they will do is send you a check for the balance. So just because my math isn't all that great, let's make it really simple. You do a job, you make $100. The agent takes $20 because that's the agent's fee from you and then they will send you a check for $80. No taxes are withheld. And what has happened to some, like I said, very successful models that I know, it's really easy if you're not disciplined and you don't have the information to get a check for $2,000, for $800, for $4,000, you know, and you just spend it. You know, you would do whatever you want to do with it and you don't realize or you're not thinking, wait a minute, I, I, I might have to pay, depending on where you live, you might have to pay city taxes on it. You might have to pay state income tax. You have to pay federal. You've got to pay Social Security. There are a lot of taxes that are involved with that. And if you did not learn how to figure out how much to set aside for taxes, when it comes time to pay your taxes, 
you better have a lot of money set set um, you know under the table so that you can well when I say under the table I'm thinking Monopoly because I used to always stick my money under the table it's a board game in case you never played Monopoly um, but basically make sure you've got enough money to pay for your taxes so unlike union acting jobs where money is withheld for taxes for you uh, for commercial modeling work there are absolutely no taxes withheld. So I would speak with, uh, you know, a CPA, uh, a financial advisor, somebody, an accountant, somebody in the industry, in the you know finance industry, who can explain to you when you make, you know, I'm throwing out a number, a hundred dollars, how much money should you be setting aside for taxes? And you've got to be disciplined with that. You've got to take that money. Uh, that is going towards taxes, set it aside so that when it comes time to pay your taxes, you have the money and you're not in this horrible situation where you've made a pretty good amount of money and now you have no money to pay your taxes. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, so Chris, Christine wrote a question. It's really, um, Christine, forgive me for saying this, but it's very long. It, we are live right now, so I'm going to I uh, attempt to unmute you and see if maybe we can have a quick dialogue between you and Aaron just because you've got a lot of questions all and wrapped up in one. Uh, when I unmute you, if you're unable to talk or you don't have a microphone or you're really just rather not do that, that's fine. We can just read it, but it might be better to just be able to talk to Aaron. So I'm going to unmute you here. And uh, Christine, can you hear us? I can. Okay. Sorry to put you on the spot. Wow, I know I didn't, I didn't prepare you, but uh, you, you had a lot of stuff you were asking in this one question. I thought maybe you'd just like to ask Aaron directly. It might be more helpful to you. Um, well, I'd really just like to understand more the process that he goes through to prepare for an audition. Um, for example, um, how long do you have a monologue uh, that, that you're working on before you use it in an audition? Or do you have a set of monologues that, um, that you use for various types of audition? Um, I just don't, I, I'd like to see more what the professional does before he gets to the audition. Okay. The reason why I was smiling as you were asking me that question is because I'm kind of like the doctor who tells his patients don't smoke and then goes out and smokes a pack of cigarettes. Um, I always tell people that I'm working with you need to have two contrasting monologues at your fingertips at all times. Uh, I would make one uh, more more serious, have one that's more comedic, if those are areas that are right for you. Um, you never know when you're going to walk in and somebody is going to ask for a monologue. And just a couple things about monologues, just in general. I've I've been in oper or been in situations where uh, I've been like either judging or observing, and people are coming out and doing monologues that are so inappropriate for them. Uh, I've heard, you know, twelve, thirteen-year-old girls talking about breakups with their husbands, and you know, and how hard it is. And it's like, you got to be kidding me! It, don't do that. You know, you're 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 in middle school here. I don't want to hear about husbands and and bad relationships and you know things like that. So make sure that the material is work that you can connect with. Make sure that it's not so well known by a famous actor that as soon as you open up your mouth, they're just hearing that actor and it's going to make you look bad. Make sure that you don't just write it yourself unless you are a really good writer. I know sometimes people will say, well, I, I want to talk about this experience uh, that I really had uh, with my father and it's something I can really relate to. Well, it, it might be something you can connect with and relate to, but if it's not written really well, then people are going to be distracted by it. It's kind of like, and I know I'm jumping a little bit, but I, it, it really is connected here. When people are creating a demo reel of taking clips of their work, let's say their acting work, and putting together a two-minute reel, sometimes people try to make it so fancy with really interesting cuts and music in the background and graphics that just grab your attention. And what happens is 
people stop looking at your work and they're judging it from a technical point of view. You know, are you a good producer? Uh, do you really know how to edit things? And and so make sure that if you're if you're doing a monologue and you do want or decide to write it, you know, you've got to make sure that it's really written well so that the words aren't jarring to people who are watching you. So Having said that about as far as finding the right monologue and making sure that you have it, the reason why I was kind of smiling is because I never use monologues. I, I just I just don't. Um, and having said that, about a year ago, um, I was auditioning for an independent feature and finished the read, and the director said, hey, um, uh, would you do a monologue for me? And I was I felt somewhat embarrassed because uh, I didn't have one and I just said to him I said honestly I said it's been so long um, I just read words that are written for me and as it turns out I still booked it so it wasn't a, it wasn't a problem but I do recommend that you do have two contrasting monologues and you have them prepared make sure they're somewhere between a minute um, it, and it, it depends on, on the situation. I know there are uh, there are places where you go and you do monologues, and they have time limits. Sometimes it's a minute. I've I've seen them up to two minutes, but I, I think a minute monologue would be pretty good. So as far as preparation goes, make sure you can you can connect with it. Make sure it's something you can uh, uh, you can really relate to. And here's the other thing too. Um, I know that we have a tendency to think that if you can cry in front of people that you're a great actor. And the, the, the fact is it's a technique and it doesn't make you a talented actor. It, it makes you somebody who can cry on cue and there are many different ways that you can do it. I mean I've heard of everything from plucking a nose hair uh, to get the tears rolling to having an onion in your pocket and kind of sticking your finger in there and just kind of you know putting your your finger to your eye and then the tears start to go or menthol or sometimes just people do sense memory it doesn't mean you're a good actor it means that you've developed a technique uh, you know it's kind of like raising one eyebrow some people can do it some people can't um, it's a technique it doesn't make you a good actor so don't get fooled into thinking that you have to do a sad monologue that is heavy, that is going to, you know, create the uh, flow of tears because people are going to love you. What, honestly, what, what I found is when I've been in situations where I've been judging or observing, the casting directors or the managers or the agents who are watching people do monologues, they get bored to death. How many times can you hear about your dog dying? I mean, it's sad, um, but what what I found is that quite often people like to hear something that that brings some joy, something that makes them laugh a little bit, something interesting. So you do want to be really careful with how you choose your monologue, and um, so you know, don't don't be thinking that it has to be something that's horrible that you're going to break down, you know, and and start you know falling on 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 the floor. Um, not necessary, but yeah, I I would say have have two monologues um, that are ready to go at any time. And the other thing too is, if you have the time to do this, what some people do is they make sure that they have a monologue that is connected in some way with the role that they are auditioning for. You know, something that puts them into the right category, something that's similar. Because, you know, if you do a monologue that has absolutely nothing to do with the character that you're reading for, it, it might not be all that helpful to the, to the director. But at least if you can put that monologue into, or find one that's in a place that it's at least relating to the character, the time period um, of, of the scene and of the play or of the movie or the TV show, that might be helpful because at least it, it will give them a little bit 
of, of a better idea of whether you can handle this kind of material and whether you're right for that particular part. But I just wanted to ask you, was there, was there something else about the preparation that you wanted to know about besides just monologue preparation? Was there something about uh, preparation for the audition itself? Yeah, do you do any research or, um, you know, when you get word that you have an audition, what do you do um, before you get there? Before well, you get to the yeah, and I can tell you it's a, it's a complicated, that's a complicated question. <laughs> Um, first of all, everybody does things differently. Some people like to do a lot of research about, you know, the character, the time period. Um, it also depends on the part, you know, that you're auditioning for. You know, when I was auditioning for, for 30 Rock, uh, there really wasn't much that I had to do as far as preparation and, and doing research goes. But here's some, I think, some more information about uh, preparation that I, I think will be really, really helpful to you. If you are auditioning for a television show that's already on the air, make sure you are very familiar with the show. Make sure you know the characters. Make sure you know uh, the pacing of the show. Certainly, you know, is it a comedy? Is it a drama? Um, and, you know, everything from whether people are over the top, is it very straight? Um, do people cut each other off on, on you know in, in the dialogue? So I would spend some time watching the show so that you're not only familiar with who the characters are, but how they interact with each other. So that when you walk in there, you're reading at the same tempo and with the same kind of intensity that everybody else on that show does. As, as a perfect example, and I never auditioned for this show, but there was a show a number of years ago called Gilmore Girls. And my daughter used to like me to watch it with her. And for those of you who, who aren't familiar with the show, it's no longer on the air. People talked really, really quickly on that show. I mean, really fast. And so if someone were to go in and audition for that show, and tried to read the lines like this at a very slow, calm, you would never get it because people were talking like this. This is how they talk to each other. They would just kind of talk like this and they, they would do that the entire show. So anyhow, make sure you uh, do your research for a television series. If it's for a feature film, here's where it gets a little bit complicated. Assuming you're not a star, you know, they're not writing this role for you in this particular movie, you probably won't know very much about the project. You probably won't know very much about your character because you weren't given the entire script. You will be given sides. And the sides is the short portion of the script that you'll be reading at the audition. So how do you prepare for something like that? Well, there are still a bunch of things that you can do. One of the questions that I always ask my agent prior to auditioning for a film is, who is the director? And the reason why that's so important is it's kind of similar to the TV show. Like directors have certain styles that they like to shoot in. So I would go to IMDb. Dot com, it's Internet Movie Database, IMDB, and look up the director and look up the other projects, the other films that this director has done. And actually, you can do that for uh, television shows as well, if, especially if it's not an existing TV show. Uh, and uh, I'm not saying you have to go out and rent every movie this person did, but you can go online, and even if you're only seeing clips of different, different projects, you'll get a good sense of what that uh, director is doing. A good example of that is when I auditioned for uh, an N. Night Shyamalan movie. Uh, it was called uh, In the Woods originally, and they changed the name to, well, I'm forgetting the name of the movie, um, Into the Woods, and they changed it. Doesn't matter. Anyhow, the point is, I was already familiar. Uh, with The Sixth Sense and, and um, some other films uh, that N. Night Shyamalan did. But just reconfirming it, watching some of the other actors and some of the other films, 
everything was very inward, uh, very little outward expressions and emotions, just a lot of internal work. And uh, that got me a callback. And I actually got a chance to read with N. Night Shyamalan. I didn't book, book the part. But, oh, The Village. That was the name of the movie. That's what they changed it to. And so um, that's very, very helpful to you to be uh, connected and familiar with the style of the uh, director. The other thing too is when you're reading, and this is this is a whole workshop all into itself, but let me just kind of give you the abridged version. When you do get the sides, sometimes there's not a tremendous amount written on the page for us. So the signs will have our lines and if you're reading with another actor, it'll have the other person's lines. Sometimes there'll be some stage direction. When I say stage direction, I'm not talking about theater. I'm talking about e even for a TV show. And like, for instance, there was an independent film that um, uh, I auditioned for, and the initial wording on the top was uh, Mark, my character, uh, walks into the building to get to his meeting. Well, that was very helpful information for me. And you might be thinking, well, what's the big deal? Okay, so the guy walks into the building. Well, the interesting thing is I'm always thinking what's happening to this actor prior to the scene taking place and what happens to the actor after the scene ends. So by seeing the words, he's walking into his office, into the building to get to his meeting. He's not rushing. He's not running late. He didn't double park his car. Um, he's not hurried because if that were the case, you know, if it says, you know, Mark's running in, that's how I'm coming into the scene. I'm coming in maybe a little bit out of breath, uh, a little bit more frazzled. I'm a little bit more nervous because I'm running late. He walks into the building. That's how the scene starts. So follow the, the uh, directions in there. And, you know, and that will give you some really good information. And the other thing, too, um, that is so crucial, and I find that sometimes actors just completely miss out on this. And I mentioned this at the very beginning. You've got to understand, who is the scene about? And if it's not about you, don't try to make it about you. And quite often, uh, you'll find that there are actors who look through the sides and only look at their lines. They'll highlight their lines, and then they'll go, okay, well, somebody says something to me here. Who cares? Here's my line. And all they do is they just study their lines. The, the problem with that is most of the time it's the other person's lines who tells you and gives you more information about your character than the words that you have. So study the other person's lines very, very carefully because it will give you really good indication as to who you are. So those are just some of the basic things that, that I highly recommend that you do when you're preparing um, to go into the audition. Um, most importantly, just from a mindset, have fun. Now, I'm not saying don't be scared. <clears throat> it can be frightening. Um, it can be really, really scary depending on the situation. But make sure you enjoy yourself, even if you are scared to death, inside, don't let people see it. Have a good time in there. When you walk into that room and the casting director says to you, hey, how you doing today? They don't want to hear it. They really don't want to know that you know you just got a speeding ticket, you know, coming to the audition. They don't want to hear that you just had a huge fight with your your wife or your boyfriend or your girlfriend, um, or that you know you've got rent due and you really need this job and you're feeling. They don't want to hear any of that stuff. Even if they ask you how are you and you're feeling hard, you're feeling great. Hey, it's great to be here. Really looking forward to the audition. That's what they want to hear. They want to hear a team player. They want to see somebody who is exuding confidence. They don't want to see somebody who is showing fear, desperation. They can smell that a mile away. And when they see somebody who's desperate, they don't want to work with them. They want to work with people they can trust, people they can count on, people who they're going to enjoy being on a set with, especially if you're working on a project and it's going to be two or three months, I want to work with somebody that's fun. Once again, on a very, very side note, but you asked me, I once asked a producer of a documentary. Uh, she would hire a camera person and a sound person. 
And I said, how do you how do you pick and choose who to do the documentary with? Because you know this woman could have chosen anybody, and there were you know tons and tons and tons of people. And what her philosophy is, she said, I go out to lunch with these people. And if I have a good time having a meal with them, enjoy the conversation, I'll hire them. I mean, I know everybody is going to be talented. Everybody can do the job. I want to surround myself with people who I like, I want to be with. So I'm not saying you've got to be the life of the party on the set. But, you know, you want to be somebody that people feel comfortable with, somebody that, you know, they can count on, somebody who's going to be professional, somebody who's going to show up on time, somebody who's not going to have a hissy fit on a set because, the uh, you know bottled water wasn't at you know quite the right temperature that you're demanding and things like that. So th those are just some of the basic key things that I'd be keeping in mind as far as preparing for an audition. But like I said, enjoy yourself no matter what happens in there. Even if you blow it, you you drop your lines, you get stuck, uh, you don't connect with the character, you do a poor read. No matter what happens in there, you walk out like you just gave the greatest performance of your life. You never hang your head low. You never apologize by saying, oh, I'm sorry. I, I know it was bad. Don't ever do that. You walk out of there like it was a great, great audition. And um, sometimes I can really help make the difference because auditions are hard. They're very difficult. It's much more difficult auditioning than being on the set and doing the job. So. Does that does that help you? Does that give you some sense of direction? Yes, thank you. Sure. And if there's anything else specific that you want to ask, really feel free. This is a good time to do it. Okay. Do you have anything else, Christine, right now, or do you want to uh, have me meet no, that's you again? Good for now. Okay. <laughs> Sorry again. Thanks for letting me put you on the spot. I uh, I appreciate you talking live. I just figured it might be better to talk directly to Aaron. So, thanks, Christine. That's it okay. Was... At least it wasn't the camera. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't do that to you. I promise. So, Aaron from Virginia, we have a question from Evelyn. Uh, she says, if I find a photographer on my own who wants to hire me, how do I know if he is legitimate? That's a, that's a good question. And you've got to be very, very, very careful if you're booking a job on your own. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. Of course, you should, you should market yourself. I think it's very helpful and smart to do that. But here are a couple things that I would keep in mind. If you are booking something on your own and it's with a photographer, um, well, I guess I guess here's the tricky part. If they, if the photographer sought you out and the person's coming in out of the blue and you have no idea how this person got to you, uh, that would make me a little bit nervous, um, you know. And I'd want to ask some very specific questions. You know, oh, how'd you have? I'm not saying you have to, you know, sound like you're you're uh, interrogating the photographer, but you know, in a very friendly way. Hey, so I, it was great. How did you happen to hear about me? Um, and make sure that you're getting an answer that seems appropriate. You know, if the, if the photographer says, "Well, I was doing uh, some searches in the area, went to your website, and and I saw this, 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 and this picture, and it just seems perfect for this particular ad," but you do have to be careful because there are lots of scams where people say, oh, love your photos and uh, you know, I want to hire you and there are many different ways that people can be scammed. But um, let's say you were doing some search and you found a photographer and they were you know, casting for a particular ad. One of the things that I would do right off the bat, check out the photographer's website. I, I don't know of any legitimate photographers who don't have their own website and when you go to the website, even if you don't know anything about photography, it doesn't make any difference. Look at it. You know, are are these, you know, uh, legitimate commercial kinds of photos? Are are these photos of you know models, people trying to be models in in you know various poses that you're not really comfortable with? Uh, so that would be one of the things. If it's a commercial photographer, sometimes not only will they show you know some of their work, but they also might have a listing of companies uh, that they've shot for. Not not all photographers want to give out that information, but sometimes they do. So let's assume that you've gone to the photographer's website. The work looks really good. Uh, these are you know legit ads that that you've seen. The other thing that I would do just to protect yourself, if you have an agent. 
send it through your agent and have the agent contact the photographer and the agent will know how to ask the right questions and negotiate for you and sometimes people will say well I you know I did this work on my own you know I found this photographer why should I give up a 20 percent commission fee well there, there are a couple reasons why it's really in your best interest to do that N number one the agent will know whether it's a legitimate photographer number two the agent is going to uh, give you a much better chance of getting paid for the job making sure that you get paid and number three they're gonna know what to charge because let's say even if you know in your particular area if you're in Virginia uh, and I don't know what part of Virginia but you know you're looking at anywhere between a hundred and hundred and fifty dollars an hour for a commercial model I mean typically because once again because there's no union there's no set fee for the amount but you know let's just say um, you know what your hourly fee is or what a, you know base rate for, for a day day rate would be but what happens if the photographer says and you want to book this thing directly we want to put this on posters and it's going to run uh, all throughout the state of Virginia on posters for a certain bank what is your fee for that high exposure format well you, you're not going to have a clue but your agent will and if the photographer says to you well if this is going to be on posters we can give you an extra two hundred dollars and you're thinking wow that's great well the agent might have gotten you five hundred dollars so for for all of those reasons I would send it to the agent and here's another reason that I think is even more important you are letting your agent know that you are bookable you are letting your agent know that you are making the agent money. That is how you get placed on the top of their list. That is how you get your agent to submit you more. That's how you get your agent to remember that you are around. And they want to submit people who book jobs. So even if you're giving up a 20% commission fee after doing all the work on your own, still it's in your best interest to go through your agent. If it's not, if you don't have an agent, and you just booked it on your own and that's fine then what I would do is and, and I'm not trying to scare anybody off you just have to be very careful today um, there are some really crazy people out there so uh, bring somebody to the set with you uh, bring somebody to the photographer studio I'm not saying they have to stand inside the studio they could be sitting outside the door in the lobby you know if you don't want them in there but you've got to have somebody with you you've got to let people know um, where you are, uh, let them know that you're going to be uh, calling them at a certain time. And once again, I, I, I hate you know I, to try to sound you know so paranoid and stuff. But really, you, you just can't be too safe um, with people you've never worked with, especially in this kind of setting. So, anyhow, th those are those are ways that I would help you know to make sure that it is legitimate and just be you know very careful and I guess the very last thing is if for any reason you you know you walk into the studio you meet the photographer you're out on location if for any reason you are feeling something's not right the photographer is giving you a vibe that's making you think I'm not feeling comfortable with this trust your instincts walk out make something up say you feel sick say uh, you just got an emergency phone call what, whatever you want to do to get out of the situation but trust yourself because you're probably on to something so anyhow those, those are the things that I would do to make sure that you're working with a legitimate photographer fantastic I think we have time for maybe one more question Aaron Okay. And uh, then we can uh, we can break for the night and potentially do one more you know some more of these in the future. But this uh, this was a great night tonight. So thank you. Here's our here's our, our final question for tonight. Alex from California writes in, um, and this kind of uh, kind of goes along with what you were just talking about, Aaron. Actually, how do you feel about companies that charge a monthly fee and promise you tons of auditions and jobs? Well, I mean charging. A monthly I'm assuming this means like on a website I mean charging a monthly fee to be on a website I mean that that's fine to me um, you know whether they charge an annual fee or a monthly fee I, I can tell you most agents 
that you're working with, especially in the commercial modeling world, uh, either have their own website and actors and models pay to be on their site or for companies that don't want to have their own website, there are a number of different companies out there that they use where the talent will sign up on the other company's website, but it's used as a way to promote the talent. It's a way for photographers and uh, producers, directors, uh, art and creative directors and advertising agencies to you know, scan different sites and look at different people, you know, depending on how sophisticated the website is, sometimes somebody can do a search and they want to find, you know, a, a, a white male between the ages of uh, uh, 30 to 40, you know, who are six feet tall and, you know, well, that's, that's a great, that would be a great tool. And I, I do pay, um, normally it's an annual fee uh, for some of those places. Now, there was a word in there or a couple words that did kind of make my hair stand up a little bit uh, when you were talking about, you know, guaranteed bookings. Th there is no such thing. You can't. You, not, not, not if you're going to be honest. Nobody can guarantee you anything. Uh, now, look, for somebody like me, I've been booked 1,185 times, and hopefully um, after Saturday and Sunday, assuming everything goes through with this independent film, it would be 1,187. Uh, having said that, there's no guarantee I'm ever going to book another job for the rest of my life. Um, I'm certainly hoping so. My family certainly is hoping so. But nobody can guarantee you work. And if they do, I'd ask for the money up front. Uh, I'd say, look, I, I agree. I am going to book a lot. So why don't you just pay me a certain fee up front and uh, I'll save you some, some paperwork later on. So you, you've got to be very careful with that. Uh, like I said, People pay to be on websites, and if it, if it is a, a place where either they are sending you information about auditions and jobs, and it is coming to your area, that sounds great. Um, you know, it's 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 a great tool to have. Uh, there's a, a company that that I use, um, uh, and I'm on their website, and I pay an annual fee, and pretty much every day uh, I'll get emails. Most of the jobs are not right for me. Uh, either they're non-union, which I can't touch, um, or uh, some of the modeling jobs that come through, and there aren't as many for that that just aren't right for me. Um, but you know, every once in a while, you know, something will come through that's right for me, and I'll submit myself uh, for the job, and that's 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 great. But there are no guarantees. So. If somebody's charging you, you know, a large upfront fee, a large monthly fee, uh, and they're promising you work and guaranteeing you work, that would make me very, very nervous. But certainly to be on a good website where you are getting, like I said, uh, good auditions, uh, go sees in the area, or Sometimes they hire people directly. Uh, they'll see your photo, uh, your resume. Maybe you've got an acting reel on there, and you, know, you can get hired directly. As long as these are jobs that you could potentially get. You know, if you're living in Oklahoma, and most of the jobs that are being posted are, you know, in Miami or in you know North Dakota or in Boston or in New York or LA, that, that's not going to be really helpful to you. You need to have jobs submitted to you that are, you know, within a, a reasonable distance for you to be able to attend. But like I said before, it's the guarantee part that made me very nervous with your question because th there are no guarantees. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Um, so this uh, pretty much wraps up our question and answer time for tonight. Thanks everybody for all the great questions. Uh, it's been fantastic. Uh, because you're a season pass holder, we are always looking for ways to continually add value to you, so stay tuned. Uh, hopefully, we'll have more goodies for you this fall. Plus, don't forget about the uh, entire workshop schedule. We've got more workshops coming up. We still have uh, how to create a strong resume. We've got how to get voiceover jobs, understanding unions, and then talking about specifically commercial modeling. This is on top of the two workshops we've already created for all of our season pass VIP special people. And uh, we want to hear from you because you're our VIP season pass holders. 
If you've got more questions, if you've got something that you'd like to ask Aaron directly, please shoot him an email at Aaron, A-A-R-O-N, at howtomodel.com. And uh, you are on the top of the list because you're a season pass holder. We want to treat you uh, as just the VIP members that you are. So we're really excited to have you on board with us for this. Also, speaking about that, if you really want to take your career uh, to the next level and you need to you know, make this happen faster for yourself, one of the things that Aaron offers is private one-on-one -on -one coaching. And with this, he can tailor... Uh, his coaching directly to you and your specific market, your specific area, your specific situation, whether you're a, a model, an actor, or both, wherever you live, Aaron can walk you through during you know Skype sessions or phone sessions, personally, just you and Aaron, one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, this is something he offers. Obviously, uh, it's, it's a fantastic value, fantastic benefit, and it really puts your career on the fast track. So if you'd like to, more information about that, please feel free to uh, email Aaron also. Again, that email address is Aaron at howtomodel.com, A-A-R-O-N at howtomodel.com to get more information about that. And in fact, there's tons of resources, free downloads, free information, uh, just a, a mass amount of information on our website over at howtomodel.com. So feel free to head over there and just check out all the great resources we have there. We're continually posting things. Aaron is continually putting out new information on a weekly basis uh, over on that website. So Aaron, thank you so much for uh, answering all the great questions tonight and for being with us as our host and being present, being here. Uh, we really appreciated you have, having you here as our host. And um, looking forward to the next time we, we get together like this. This has been great. My pleasure, Joel. This was a lot of fun, and it, it's it's great to be able to connect uh, with people, and um, and also you know give people really helpful information to help guide them. Because, look, you know this is it's it's a tough business, and and it's uh, it is a business. A lot of people don't really know how to maneuver, and they don't know how to do things in in the right way, and they spin their wheels, you know, and spend years doing things by trial and error. And, you know, I, people, some people have been very helpful to me in, in sharing information, and I think it's a nice thing to be able to do with others and, uh, you know, just build this, continue to build this community of people trying to help each other. So, yeah, actually, I was just going to say, if you go to uh, the facebook.com forward slash how to model page, if you have other questions, you know, post it there, and I, I certainly will answer them. Um, hopefully, other people will answer them as well. And it's a way of building this great community of people interested in the acting and modeling in industry from literally around the world. I mean, I know we have people from Dubai, South Africa, uh, Europe, uh, all throughout North America. Um, it's really Australia. Australia. Yeah, it's really it's pretty incredible to be able to touch uh, people from literally all around the world and share information with them. Fantastic. So that again is facebook.com forward slash how to model and uh, feel free to like that page and join us over there as well on a regular basis. Well, thanks, Aaron. Thanks, everybody. Uh, it's been great and uh, we're going to get this posted online, the recording of the session, and we'll talk to everybody really soon. Have a great night.